Thanks, guys. That is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis, and we chopped it in half. Um, it's also really bizarre, isn't it? A chapter on arranged marriages and these wretched camels. I don't know whether you had a, a just-so-happened moment. It just so happened. It had those moments? just so happened that 28 years ago, I missed a train in London. And on the next train that I happened to catch, I sat next to a man who became a friend, and that friend then funded me through the Hall of Bible College. It just so happened that I was in Mossman a few weeks ago, and I bumped into somebody who I'd been praying for for about six months, and they just so happened to invite themselves to church. It just so happened I was sitting in a cafe with a really, really, really good friend when I got a phone call with some tragic news, and that person was there to comfort me. Just so happened that I had a car accident, and the lady I bumped into got out of the car. We started talking about God. I invited her to Alpha, and she became a Christian. It just so happened on Monday morning this week, someone sent me a text with a Bible verse that I had no idea that I would really need to hear that day. Ever happened to you? All, all these things that just so happen in your life. Uh, we call them coincidences. If you're a Christian tonight, if you believe in Jesus Christ, th there is no just so happen because we believe in a God who is over all things and in control of all things and in all the details. We worship a God who is sovereign over all things. His hand is in all the minute details of your lives. There's no coincidence. There's no fate. There's no fortune. There's no accident. It's called God's providence. God's providence is, is a big word. It just means that God is in all things, over all things, behind all things, before all things, and nothing happens in our lives that he doesn't know about. I, I know for some of us here, that doctrine of providence it is kind of paralyzing. You feel trapped. You can feel like you're a, a pawn on God's cosmic chessboard. It's not supposed to be like that. God's providence is supposed to be this massive comfort. To know that you are in the hands of a loving God who is all-powerful and all-able and kind and good, and he's involved in every tiny detail of your life. That's a massive comfort, isn't it? And Genesis 24 is all about God's providence. You see, it just so happened that Abraham wanted to find a wife for his son Isaac, and it just so happened that the servant went to this right town, and it just so happened that she's at a well, and it just so happened that she offered to water his camels, and it just so happened she's from the line of Abraham, and it just so happened that she agreed to go to a weird country with a man she'd never met before, and it just so happened that Isaac fell in love with her. Is that it? There's no just so happened. This is God's good, sovereign, kind, hand over these tiny details, just weaving the lives of these two people together. And it's beautiful. Uh, this doctrine of God's providence, it, it will just bring you such comfort and such clarity, even, even in those times when you don't like what's happening. Let me tell you how not to apply Genesis chapter 24. This chapter is not... God's blueprint on how to find the perfect spouse. Please don't use it like that. Please, please don't bargain with God and say, okay, God, I'm going to go to a bar in Crow's Nest, and she must be wearing a blue dress, and she must be wearing rosé, and she must offer to feed my wretched cats. <laughs> that is ridiculous. This is a chapter on God's promises and God's providence. What God has actually promised you and the way he orders your life. And so we start with God's promises, living in light of God's promises, because that's what Abraham does in this chapter. Abraham's whole life is, is shaped by, is driven by the promises that God has made him. 
And it's almost like he, he wakes up every day, not just knowing the promises, but believing the promises and living by those promises. So in chapter 23, Sarah has died. She's 127. And in chapter 23, Abraham is determined that, that Sarah will be buried in the land. So with great expense and great effort, he buys a plot of land. Why would he do that? Because he's living by the promises. Remember God's promises? God has promised Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, there's going to be a great nation, a great name, and great blessing, and the land. And so in chapter 23, he buys the land, tick. Chapter 24, verse 1, Abraham was now very old. Literally, it says he's getting on in years. What a great phrase, he's getting on in years. He's 140. I feel like I'm getting on in years, age 53. He is extremely old. He's about to die. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. So he's been blessed. Tick. He's got the land. Tick. Now what part of God's promises have not been fulfilled yet? It's that promise of a nation, of a people. Because at this point in his life, it's just him and his son Isaac. And he's about to die. And you can imagine Abraham looking at his son Isaac and saying, Oh, Isaac, what's wrong with you? You're unmarried, aged 40. Poor Isaac. Going to be lonely all your life. Poor Isaac, living a second-rate life. Is that what he's saying? Of course it's not. How dare he say it? Because the Bible elevates singleness as it's a good gift from God. He's not talking like that because he's obsessed with marriage. He's talking like that because he's obsessed with the promises of God. Because Abraham realizes that he's about to die and Isaac is not married and there are no kids. And so that's the end of the promises. There'd, there'd be no nation. That's why he wants to find Isaac a wife. So in verse 2, Abraham calls in a servant who I think is Elias of Damascus, the man who we met in chapter 15. There's a bizarre oath in verse 2. Don't you love the Bible? Uh, Put your hand under my thigh, he says. You, you know, in today's age, you, you swear on the Bible. Put your hand on the Bible, make an oath. Uh, at least to put the hand under the thigh. Or it gets even worse than that. Literally, it says, put, place your hand under my genitals. But let's not think about that. He says, swear, make an oath, swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. This is important, church. Isaac needs a wife, but she can't be Canaanite. She can't be a woman who worships a different God. And we say, Lord... Look, why are you narrowing the field? I mean, there's all these beautiful, nice, kind Canaanite women around there. Surely God won't mind if they don't have the same faith. No, God does mind. God says, no, 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 no. She can't be a Canaanite because they worship a different God. It's not about race. It's about religion. You can't be yoked to somebody who has different beliefs. It is really hard to do that. Verse 5, he says, okay, so what if this wife is unwilling to come back to this land? Shall I take Isaac back to your home country? Verses 6 to 9, he says, no, 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 no. We must live in the land. So that's the logic of this chapter. God has promised that from Abraham is going to come a great people, a great nation. But it's just Isaac now. No wife, no kids. So find a wife, have kids. She can't be a Canaanite from the line of Abraham and in the land. And I love Abraham because he, he lived by God's promises every day. It's almost like what he knew about God shaped all his decisions, all his choices, and all his actions. Now, could you describe yourself like that? Somebody who is so persuaded about the promises of God that those promises shape every single decision and every every single choice, every single day. Because if you believe in Christ, God has made you some extraordinary promises, hasn't he? 
He's promised to be your heavenly father who cares and adores you as his child. He's promised to provide and to protect and to be present even in the darkest of valleys. Do you believe that? Do you live it? Do you make choices based on that? He has, he has promised, if you're a Christian, he's promised that, that this is not home. This earth is not as good as it gets. He's promised that one day the Lord Jesus Christ will return from heaven and take you home. He's promised that this body of yours is failing, but one day you'll have a new body. Do you live each day in light of those promises? Do you make decisions and choices thinking it could be today that my Lord Jesus Christ is going to return? It's challenging, isn't it? But this chapter is not really about God's promises. This chapter is about, is about God's providence. Living under God's providence. That idea that God's hand is over and in every minute detail of your life. And the thing I love about this chapter is there's nothing miraculous about it. This is not a story about God opening barren wombs. It's not a story about God bringing down far from heaven or God dividing a Red Sea. This is a story about an ordinary woman going to an ordinary well at exactly the right time, having the right conversations and having her life completely turned around by God's hand. And that's why I love it because that's my life and that's your life. Most of us here not, do not have miraculous lives. We have mundane lives. But you've got to believe that God's hand is in every minute detail of your life. When I think about God's providence, I always think of three T's. Thinking, talking, and thanking. Thinking, talking, thanking. Thinking rightly in light of God's providence, in light of my belief that God's in control of all things, how am I going to think? What's my brain going to think about uh, talking, make sure I'm talking to God, praying to God, and then thanking, making sure that I'm actually grateful for his sovereign, guiding hand over my life. Let, let's start with the thinking bit. Thinking rightly. Then in verse 10, the servants take 10 of Abraham's camels. Uh, camels were very rare, so Abraham had 10 of them, so he's a very wealthy man. And we're told in verse 10, he loads them up with all kinds of good things. This is the dowry to pay for the bride. Now, here's the question. Where is the servant going to go to find a wife? Where should he go to find the perfect wife? And here's a lesson. Just because God is in control, just because God's in control doesn't mean that you switch off your brain. Knowing that God's in control and in all things means that you, you think wisely, you think biblically, you think rightly what is the right thing to do. So where's the servant going to go to find a wife? He, he does not go to the most convenient town. He doesn't go to the nearest town, into the first bar and say, hey, I'm a servant of a really, really wealthy man and he's got one eligible son left, the only son actually, and I've got ten roses here and who's going to be the lucky woman tonight? Because that's the way the world thinks. What does he do? He switches on his brain. He thinks, where should I go? He knows that Abraham's relatives are in a town called Nahor. So he goes there, verse 10. He doesn't go to a bar. He goes to a well in verse 11. Because the well is where the women gather. He doesn't go in the morning. He goes in the evening, verse 11. Because that's when the women go to draw water. So he, he switches on his brain. He doesn't sit back. He's actually deliberate in the choices he makes. Because when you know that God's hand is over your life, you start to think wisely. I, I, I keep meeting unmarried people in our church who long and desire to be married. That's a good desire, isn't it? But, but lots of them just sit back and do absolutely nothing, expecting God to just produce a spouse and give them on a lap. Or, or perhaps even worse, they, they, they just make dumb decisions. They just hang out in the bars and the clubs, and they meet somebody, fall in love with them who's not a Christian, and it's a mess. If you desire to be married, they think wisely. They 
Church is a great place to meet people or Christian conferences or Christian dating apps. Think wisely. Same, same with married people. I keep meeting married people who, are, who says, our, our, our marriage is really quite difficult right now. We have no time for each other. I'm saying, well, well think about it. You're both working crazy, crazy, crazy hours in his full-time job. You have no time to talk to each other, no time to have fun together, no time to communicate or even read the Bible. Think about it and make different decisions. My point is, just because God's in control doesn't mean that you do nothing. You think wisely. And then what do you do? Verse 12 is very interesting. What does a servant do? If God's in control, what do we do? Then he, he prayed. He talked to God. Isn't that bizarre? God's in control of all things, and this man gets down on his knees and he prays. And people say to me, Paul, why, why bother praying if God's in control? I want to say, why would you bother praying if God was not in control? What's the point of that? Or why would you not talk to the one who is in control of all things? Of course you pray. God's providence drives you to your knees in prayer. What does he pray? Verse 12, Lord God, make me successful today. It's a prayer of many a man on his first date. Make me successful today and show kindness, hesed, steadfast love to my master. He's saying, God, you're in control, so please be kind to me today. Please show me the woman. And then maybe... You need to learn that simple truth that God's providence drives you to your knees to pray. Stop being in control of all things. Stop being proud. Stop being self-reliant and actually start praying. So the servant prays and we're back to thinking wisely in verse 13. So he's standing at the well and all these women approach the well to draw water. So how is he going to determine who is God's chosen woman. If he stands at the well and all these women are coming towards him, what could he do? He, he could do what most shallow men do. He could look at the externals. Oh, she's the right height. Oh, she's the right body shape. Oh, she's got the right color hair. Oh, she looks beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that the way the world thinks? But this man is not like that. He is more concerned about her character than he is her externals, her heart. It says in verse 14, May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she will say, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So he's saying, I don't want to judge on the external. I want to know what her heart is like. And I want a woman who will be kind and selfless and other person-centered and generous. So here's the simple test. Let her offer my camels some water as well. And just so you understand this test, a camel would drink about 25 gallons of water. And her jar would hold three gallons. And there are 10 wretched camels. And so this woman would have to go to the well about a hundred times to feed these camels. That's about two hours of hard, sweaty labor from this poor, poor woman. But that's the kind of woman that he wants for Isaac, a woman who will be kind and generous and sacrificial and selfless. Not about external beauty. I love verse 15. Before he had finished praying. Look at those words. Before the servant had finished praying, Rebecca appears. So before he'd finished praying, God had already answered his prayer. Before he said the Amen. Rebecca must have left her house. Either before he prayed or whilst he was praying. We don't know what she was. But, but God knew that Rebecca was the answer to his prayers. God always knows the answer even before you started praying. And that's a comfort, isn't it? But let's think about Rebecca, because this was the day that her life was going to change. She woke up that morning, and she walked out of that door like she did every single morning. But this was a day when God's plan for her life, God's purpose for her life, was going to change. She left a, a single woman. She returned betrothed. And you know, God does that sometimes, doesn't he? You wake up one day, 
And you have absolutely no idea that this is the day that your life is going to change. And sometimes you wouldn't even choose the way it was going to change. I often say that I'm really thankful in God's kindness. I'm really thankful that he does not show me exactly what's going to happen in my life for the next 10 years. He doesn't show me all those twists and turns and those those mountains and valleys. He's going to take me through because if he showed me the next 10 years, I would say, no way, I can't do that. That's impossible. That's too hard. He doesn't show me that. He just shows me today and the next day and the next day. And you look back on the last day and you think, gosh, how did I get through all of that? With God's help, you did. Praise God for that, yeah? So God's in all the details, he orchestrates our lives. So at the same time the servant is praying, Rebecca's walking to the well and, and they meet each other. And it just so happened in verse 15 that Rebecca is from the right family, Abraham's line, a close relative, a, a cousin once removed. Just so happens in verse 16 that she's a virgin, she is not married, she hasn't slept with anyone. Just so happened that she is very beautiful, verse 16, but that's a bonus, not an essential. Just so happened in verse 16, she went down to the spring to fill her jug. Just so happened in verse 17 that the servant met her and said, please give me a water. It just so happened in verse 18 that she said, drink, my Lord. She's so kind. She's so generous. But you're supposed to read the Bible with this kind of tension this nervous tension, because you come to verse 18 and she's offered the servant a drink, and what are you thinking? You're supposed to be thinking, what about the camels? What about the camels? Come on, feed the camels, come on. Verse 19, after she gave him her drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. And you're thinking, this is the one. Isn't God good? This beautiful, selfless, humble, hard-working woman. She spends two hours, hard, sweaty labor, feeding those stupid camels. While the servant just stood there doing nothing. And I'm sure she's thinking, what a rude little man you are. <laughs> That's how you're supposed to read the Bible. It's humorous. Verse 22, she adorned with his gold, these nose ring, these bracelets. This, this is the dowry. And then he asked her in verse 23, whose daughter are you? Could you possibly be related to Abraham? And she is, praise God, verse 24, I'm the daughter of Bethuel. Praise the Lord. Now, how do you respond when you recognize God's directing and guiding hand in your life? Do you grumble? Or are you grateful? Do you whinge? Or do you praise? Love verse 26. The man bowed down and and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and his faithfulness to my master. Praise be to God for your good guiding hand. Thank you, Lord, for orchestrating all these events. It was like a needle in a haystack. I couldn't do it, but you did it, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You did the impossible. We praise you and we thank you, Lord God. Is that how you end your days? Do you stop at the end of every day and look back on God's providential hand over that day and just spend time worshipping him and praising him? I, I tried to do it this week. As I say, on Monday I got this, this, this random text with a Bible verse that I, I, I didn't know that I would really need to lean on that day. Thank you, Lord, for that. On Tuesday I turned up at Alpha and none of my table turned up. None of them. And then God brought these other people to this table. We had the most brilliant two hours. Praise you, Lord, for that. On Wednesday, I looked at my diary, and I was like, oh, gosh, I've got meetings back to back. I've got no time to actually start to prepare a sermon. And then two people canceled their meetings. That was God's providence. Thank you, Lord, for that. And I got home uh, with about 10 minutes before the belonging course started and 25 people were going to descend on our house. And I hadn't seen my wife for, for such a long time. And you know what? For those 10 minutes, my four boys were perfectly behaved. That never happens. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for that. Those little moments, you go, thank you. I can see your hand there, God. 
And this week I've been carrying a few burdens, some heavy burdens, which you'll find about, about soon. But, you know, I, I needed someone to talk to, and everyone I reached out to wasn't available. And then suddenly this, I got this text from a, a friend in New Zealand saying, the Lord's laid on your heart, are you okay? Do you want to talk? I think, thank you, Lord, for that. Please don't take those things for granted. They are God's good, guiding, providing, providential hand. And the right response is to get on your knees and to worship him and to praise him and to thank him. To give him the glory. God's providence is often described as a tapestry, this beautiful tapestry where you see the beautiful picture on the outside, but behind the beautiful picture is just mess, isn't it? Look behind the tapestry, all those threads, it's messy, they're going everywhere. You're thinking, oh, that's horrible. Turn it over, you see the beautiful picture. That's what God is doing as he weaves his hand in our lives. He is creating this beautiful picture that you just can't see yet. I love this poem by Corrie Ten Boom. It's called Life is But a Weaving. It's on the screen. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in a weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can do. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. It's humbling. It's hard to step back and say, God, this is your hand. This is your plan. This is your purpose. And sometimes I don't like it, but I trust that you're over it and in it and behind it and before it. And it is liberating. The whole story is repeated in verses 28 to 51. There's no time to go through it, but it's about the family agreeing to this arranged marriage. We do meet a, a very nasty man, really, in verse 29. His, man, his name is Laban. He's not a nice man. He's sly. He's sleazy. He's deceptive. He, he's motivated by money in verse 30. He sees the nose ring. He sees the bracelet. He sees the camels, and he's thinking, ka-ching, Money, this is a way to get rich. He, he's a deceiver. He's the man who deceived Jacob with Leah and Rachel, if you know that story. He's sly, sleazy, deceptive. But do you know what? God sometimes uses sly, sleazy, deceptive people in the story of your life. And that's okay, isn't it? God can use people who are a bit dodgy to bring about his good purposes. And I find that strangely comforting. <laughs> Verse 50, Laban says, this is from the Lord, let her go. But verse 57 is really the key moment. Because Rebecca's a good fit. The family have said, yes, she can go. But let's call the young woman in, shall we? <laughs> Don't you find verse 57 extraordinary? They said, let's call the young woman in and ask her. Isn't this bonkers? That They've agreed a price. They've told her she can go, but they haven't actually asked her yet whether she wants to go. That's outrageous, isn't it? They call Rebecca in verse 58 and ask her, will you go with this man? And again, you're supposed to read the Bible with tension because everything hangs on her answer. She could say no. What would you do if she said, no, I don't want to marry this man I've never met before? She could do that, you know. And again, I was thinking this week, sometimes God does do that. Sometimes in our lives, he seems to be weaving this story, taking us down this path, and it's green light, green light, green light, green light, and suddenly, bang, red light. You're thinking, God, what was that? I thought we were going this way, and suddenly you've done a massive U-turn. Ever happened to you? What do you do in those moments? Get angry? Why, God? That's my natural tendency. 
Uh, thankfully, I'm married to a woman who has such an incredible grasp on God's sovereignty. She just says, Paul, God's got it, God's in it, God's in control of it. And I felt like saying, I don't want to hear that right now, but she is right. And it's liberating. There's a man in our church who's been looking for a job for over 12 months. And the last couple of months, he, he seemed to find the perfect job. And it was green light, green light, green light, interview, second interview, third interview, down to the last two. And then he phoned me to say, I didn't get the job. I was second choice. <laughs> and then he said, I'm deeply disappointed, but I prayed about it, and this can't be God's plan for my life. What, what, what an incredible man of God that is. Uh, last year, I spent a lot of time around 2 a.m. in the morning, most nights, on my knees in prayer, pleading with God for something, pleading with God, pleading with God, and the answer was no, 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 no. What did I do at that point? Grumble, win, shout, or just trust God. So you see, when you've got a grasp of God's providence, you say, this is not my plan, and I'm not in control, but you are God, and that is liberating. Anyway, Rebecca does say yes, praise God. She said in verse 58, I will go. And like Abraham before her, she leaves her family, leaves her country to a place that God will show her. And like Abraham in verse 60, she is blessed. And that's the end of the story. Well, not quite. Because who haven't you met in the story yet? We haven't met Isaac yet. Isn't that bizarre? Isaac has had a wife found for him. But he's never met her. And everyone else thinks that they're a perfect match. But maybe God's going to do something unpredictable as he often does. Look at verse 62. Isaac came from Bilaha. He was living in Negev. And he went out to the field to meditate or to pray. He's asking God. He's pleading with God. As he looked up, he saw, here they are again, the camels. He saw the camels approaching. And Rebecca also looked up and their eyes met for the first time as she saw Isaac. She got down from her camel, verse 65, and she asked the servant, who is that man? And literally the tone is, who's that? Whoa, what a hunk of a guy he is. Whoa, I want him. And the servant answered, he's my master. It's Isaac. Wow. And she gets dressed as a bride. She puts on her veil and she covered herself. And then they fall in love and get married. Is that, is that how it happens? They fall in love and then get married? No, no, actually, that's a Western story. They got married, verse 67, and then they fall in love. And I love this story because it really is about ordinary people living ordinary lives under the hand of an extraordinary God who's in every minute detail of our lives. And when you start to see all those just-so-happen moments, not as coincidence, not as chance, not as fate, not as fortune, but as God's kind, good hand in your life, it is so beautiful. <laughs> now, for 10 years before I got married, I got married at 40, a bit of an Isaac. For 10 years before I got married, almost every single week, I kid not, almost every single week, some Christian tried to set me up on a blind date with somebody. And I'd say, no, 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 no. In October 2008, I got a phone call from a friend saying, hey, do you want to come down to Barrel on a long weekend? And I meet this Christian lady. She's a widow with a three-year-old. And for some bizarre reason, I said, yes. And I have absolutely no idea. I remember running around the harbor thinking, what am I doing? I have no idea why I said yes, but that was God's hand for my life. Uh, 20 years ago, I was offered a job at a church in Brighton in the UK. I'd love to live by the beach. It was right on the beach. Great church. But I had no peace about it. I said no to it. Everyone's saying, what are you doing, Paul? That's a good job in a great church. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I got a phone call from Sydney, offered me a job at St. Thomas's North Sydney. That was God's hand in my life, bring me to Sydney. As a brand new Christian, I was invited to be a leader on a youth camp for private school boys. And then two weeks later, I was uninvited because they found out I didn't go to a private boys' school, and they said I couldn't minister to private, bo private school boys. And I thought that Grace was a great leveler. Anyway, um, 
But God's good hand was I went to a youth camp for public school kids, and on that camp I met two people who became my mentors for the next 10 years. Why am I sharing these stories? Because sometimes God does things that you don't know what he's doing and why he's doing it, but you've got to trust his good plan for your life. And when you try and fight it, it never ends well. You're supposed to trust. Trust he's in it and over it. You're supposed to talk to him and say, God, what are you doing here? And he's supposed to thank him. And say, thank you, God, for your good providential hand over my life. So, church, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is over all things, in all things, behind and before, in every intricate detail of your beautiful life? Because when you do, you start to allow him to write your story rather than you trying to write your own story. Let me pray. Father God, thank you that you always keep your promises. Thank you that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, you are good, and you are so, so kind. Father, thank you, thank you that our lives are in your hands, not in our hands or someone else's hands. Father, forgive us for times we don't trust you. Forgive us for times we don't ask Forgive us the times we make dumb, worldly decisions. Lord, send us into this week delighting in your providence. Confident, Lord, that you are in all things and over all things. And for that we say thank you. In Jesus' name.